Um, we are in the middle of a series we're calling The Good Life. Uh, it is our series for the summer, and we are, are jumping into um, a, a specific sermon that Jesus taught. We find it in the book of Matthew, in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. It's called The Sermon on the Mount, because it may surprise you, Jesus preached it on a mountain. And it's very great naming. And, um, and it's probably Jesus' most famous sermon. Or the reason he taught it on a mountain was because he could speak from up high and speak to people who were below him and they could hear him. So he was able to speak to a lot of people. And the themes that we see in the Sermon on the Mount, we see re- repeated in Scripture. So we know it's not just this one time that Jesus taught this, but he would have taught this throughout his ministry. But, but Matthew 5, 6, and 7 are the most comprehensive uh, a manuscript that we have of this sermon. If you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Matthew 6. We'll jump into verse 5 here in just a few minutes. Uh, but before we do, we have to recognize that there's a kind of a transition that's happened within uh, Jesus' teaching at, at this point. You know, if you've been here in the weeks before, we've been looking at these phrases. Um, there's six of them, and, and usually they start with Jesus saying something like, you've heard it said or you've heard it taught this way, but I tell you this way, right? And in this, Jesus is revealing how he, Jesus, he, he's the, he completes the law, right? The law, when he's referring to, is the information we have in the Old Testament, right? He, and when Jesus says he completes it, he says, I've come not, not to do away with it, not to get rid of it, but to fulfill it. I'm not, I'm not throwing out the Old Testament. I'm making it better. And we know that he does that through the crucifixion and resurrection, which he, it hasn't actually happened yet in the story, but, but it, he's alluding to what he will accomplish for us on the cross. And so when Jesus comes, and Jesus comes to complete the law, we've been looking at how Jesus takes these things that seem impossible for us to accomplish because we are physically incapable of it. But what happens is Jesus transforms our hearts, and he does something in us and through us that we are not capable of doing on our own. Right? That's what we've been in for the past six weeks. This week, we're going to transition into a new section uh, of the Sermon on the Mount. We're going to talk about the concept of prayer this morning. And prayer is one of those things. I don't know uh, how many of you grew up in kind of more traditional church settings. I grew up Southern Baptist. I was, a, I was a PK, which means I was a preacher's kid. That's a nice way of saying I could kind of be a brat sometimes. And Growing up, I remember, I don't know if any of you grew up kind of traditional Southern Baptist, but, uh, but for me, Wednesday nights was always kind of a few things would always happen. If we were lucky, there was going to be a potluck. <laughs> and you would learn who's got the good food <laughs> and who's got the bad food. And you would even learn like the dishes to recognize like, oh, that dish looks new, but it's in that dish. And last week, that dish and that did not taste good. I'm going to go ahead and avoid that. <laughs> right. There was always fried chicken. You can't find a Southern Baptist church that does not have a potluck with, with fried chicken. Like it's impossible. Like the universe would implode if that ever happened. There's always fried chicken at a Southern Baptist potluck. And which that was the best part. Right. The food was the best part. It's like a buffet, but at church and you keep going back. And there's always tons left over. Now, then after that, Southern Baptists usually on Wednesday nights do this thing called business meeting. Because Southern Baptists are run by each, in, like the, each congregation is called autonomous. They, they're autonomy of the Baptist church. They're all run by themselves. So they talk about business stuff. And that was kind of boring. But then as a kid, the most boring part and why I was desperate for like children's activities or youth activities was because if we didn't have those activities, I had to sit through Wednesday night prayer meeting. And it was the most boring hour of my life because everyone would talk about all the same stuff we talked about last week and give the same prayer requests we gave last week. And then we would just pray about them and really like monotone voices. I don't know if you've ever seen or heard one of those Southern Baptist pastors like, and now we're going to pray, dear father, like you don't, <laughs> you're my dad, how you talk normally, like what's going on here? Like, so I'm sitting through this and I just keep in my mind just waiting for it to be over, like thinking in my mind, like, can I go sneak out and get another piece of pound cake from the potluck line? Like, what's my strategy here? And I just was desperate for it to end because I thought prayer was boring. That was me as a kid. But here's the problem. There's many of us. And if I'm really honest with you, sometimes that's me. That even as an adult, I can occasionally still think prayer may be boring. And I think it's a pervasive thing that we see all throughout, even 
Christendom, like people have this concept that prayer is boring. Or maybe it's not boring. Maybe you think that prayer is hard. Or maybe you just forget to pray. We kind of have this concept of prayer that we view as mealtimes, right? Is, is prayer is what gets in between us and eating. We got to get the blessing out of the way. Again, I'm from the South. We don't say blessing. We take that G and throw it away. It's blessing, right? We got to say the blessing first. Or maybe you're in a small group or you're, 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 you're with a group of people and you make sure at the end we always have prayer requests. And we always get this list, all right? It's the right thing to do. It's a formulaic thing. We're going to check off the box of prayer, all right? Because we're going to ask everybody for their prayer requests. We're going to write them down. Okay, we prayed for them. Good. We got it. Check. And I think the problem with this is that we're approaching prayer with a certain mindset. And in doing so, it's easy for us to miss out on what prayer really is. And our concept of prayer that we can look at, we're going we're gonna to dive into Matthew 6 here in just a second. But this is what I, I need you to understand, that prayer is a relational conversation, right? That's the whole concept today, is prayer is a relational conversation. And it's not a one-way conversation. It's back and forth. And so when we're talking about this today, I want you to view this in view of how you would have a conversation in any other relationship in your life. Like if I came up to Rick... And every time I said I saw Rick, I was like, hey, Rick, just so you know, I need this, I need this, I need this, I need this, I need this. Amen. <laughs> it's not very relational, right? And I think that Jesus talks about this pretty specifically. So let's jump in and see what he has to say, starting in verse 5 of Matthew 6. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites. All right? So the first thing is don't pray like somebody. For they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you that they have received their reward. So it gives us this first group of people that we should not pray like, which is hypocrites, who stand on the corner and they pray loud and they pray big and they pray so that other people can hear them pray. When I talk to someone, I shouldn't talk to someone so that someone else could hear me. I should talk to someone so that person can hear me. That just makes sense. If I, if I need to t- say something to you, I'm not going to go, we do this, maybe... Uh, you joke at your dinner table like this too, but sometimes when all of my family gets around and like we're pretend mad at each other, sometimes maybe a little real mad at each other, like at Thanksgiving, and someone will be like, hey, will, instead of saying, hey, will you ask so-and-so to pass some, ma- or will you pass some mashed potatoes? It's like, uh, excuse me, will you ask Cassie to pass some mashed potatoes? I'm not talking to her right now. <laughs> like, I mean, that, that's it, right? It, it's talking about someone to someone else. It's not this, this overheard on the side, right? If we're talking to God, we should be talking to God. But there are people who pray so that they can be heard and say, oh, well, look how religious and special they are. Look how good they look praying. They must be so spiritual. Jesus says, don't do that. Don't do that at all. He says, right? he says do the opposite of that. Verse 6, but when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. Jesus says, if you're going to go talk to the Father, talk to the Father. You don't need to have everyone else see you to talk to the Father. If your goal in prayer is to have other people see you, then that's your reward. But you're missing something. You're missing out on that relationship. You're missing out on that conversation with the creator of the universe. He keeps on going. Verse 7, and when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. We all know people who do this, right? That all of a sudden when they start praying, their vocabulary completely changes. It's like, when did you learn Old English? Like, you don't talk to me like that. Have you ever met one of those people who they actually make up a word in a prayer, and you're like, I'm pretty sure that didn't exist before this prayer? But we feel like we have this eloquence that we have to deliver in our prayers and we have to get across. And Jesus is saying, it doesn't matter how fluffy your words are. You ever go to a, um, you ever go to a restaurant that has chips or, or bread before your meal and ever eat so many of them that by the time your food comes, it's like, oh man, I'm full. Like, I'm, I'm going to miss out on the meat because I filled up on all this, like, carbs. They may have been delicious, but, like, I missed my main course. Jesus says, don't add those extra words, but verse 8, do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. God knows the meat. He knows the necessity. 
Don't fill up on chips and bread when God already knows what you need. You're missing the point here. But this actually brings up another interesting fact. If God knows our needs already before we pray, then why do we pray? What's the point? We good? Like, we can just stop? Jesus says, do not be like them, for your Father knows what you, what, you, what you need before you ask Him. But then He says this, and when you pray, pray like this. So Jesus talks about how the Father knows our needs and then gives us an example of prayer. We're going to jump into that here in just a second. Before we do, I want to I wanna take a minute and, and look at some of the concepts that we see with this relational aspect of what Jesus tells us not to do. You see, when he says don't do these two things, and he gives these two examples, don't be like uh, the hypocrites or some actually other places it talks about Pharisees doing this. Don't be like Pharisees who pray on the street corner to be heard. Go in your prayer closets, go behind a shut door instead, right? And don't be like the Gentiles using words, right? He, he, think about each of these things in relational terms. Celebrities deal with the concept of, of people wanting to be friends with them just to be seen all the time. It's this idea that, oh, this person's famous, like I want to be seen by them so other people can see me with them. That's not a relationship. That's actually an abusive relationship. Like that, that's not a positive thing. I think my wife is the most beautiful woman in the world. And while I think it's a benefit that everybody gets to see me with someone so beautiful, like it would be really messed up if I got married just so people could see me with someone really pretty. It's a benefit, but it's not, it would be a terrible reason to get married. Right? I mean, and in, in, in look what he talks about the Gentiles when he talks about how they use superfluous words. No one got that joke first service either. <laughs> I, I was really proud of that joke when I wrote it. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, man. So glad we don't have the room mics turned on for the live stream. How, how would our relationships be if we just used fancy words and didn't back up what we said? Teenagers are actually experts at this. Right? How many teenagers say, oh, I love you so much. We're going to be together forever. You're the best thing that's ever happened to me. I'm avoiding eye contact with the teenagers <laughs> right now. Right? In some sense, they can't help it because their prefrontal cortex isn't fully developed until like 22. <laughs> Man, second service was a good time today. <laughs> right, but I mean, think about it. I mean, as adults, we see teenagers using these words going, you don't have no idea what you're talking about. It's less than one out of ten high school romances actually pan out. But how many of those high school romances, well, we're going to be together forever. I love you so much. I was a middle school pastor. I saw middle school, like these like, Seventh graders, I'm like, you don't even know what you're saying. <laughs> but that's what Jesus says people do with prayer. We say these words and we don't mean them. We don't even know what we're saying. We're just saying the big words, the, the, the chips and bread words, and we're missing the main point. It's interesting because what Jesus does for us And what Jesus al accomplished on the cross is something significantly greater, I think, than we sometimes think. This is what I mean by that, right? In terms of relationship, either of those options are terrible options. But what we get to do, what we get to enter into when we are praying is that we are having a relational conversation with the Father, the creator of the entire universe. But not all times in history was that even possible. Look, in Matthew 27, 51, during the crucifixion, after Jesus died, like after it is finished, Jesus has died on the cross. It says, and behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks were split. Right? That's an easy verse to pass over, but this is what that meant. The, the curtain in the temple, the temple veil, it was this big, thick, velvet curtain, right? Like crazy thick. And when Jesus died, it ripped. And behind that curtain was a place called the Holy of Holies. And in the Holy of Holies was where the presence of God himself would sit. And you see, normal men and women like me and you, we couldn't go to the Holy of Holies. A priest could go to the Holy of Holies like once a year. 
And they always had like a rope around his foot in case he died because of the sheer awesomeness of the presence of God. They could pull his body out. That's true. Right? So, so, so to approach God, to have a conversation with God, to have a relationship with God is impossible without Jesus because our sin separates us from God. But when we choose to follow Jesus, the cross bridges that gap. And so when Jesus is giving this example that we're going to jump into here in just a second of how to pray, he's doing so because the cross that he would go to the cross that we get to experience the benefit of, the resurrection from the dead, the defeating of death itself, that bridges the gap that our sin created. And so once we were separated from God because of sin, through Jesus we can connect and have a relationship with God. You see, our sin separates us, but Jesus bridges that separation. And in Matthew 6, beginning in verse 9, Jesus tells us how to pray. He says, pray like this. This is a prayer that we all know, at least most of us. It doesn't matter if you're Catholic, if you're evangelical, if you're Baptist, if even Eastern Orthodox know the Lord's Prayer, right? This is something that we've all learned at some point. It says, if you pray, pray like this. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And from the other Gospels, we, that's not in this one. It says, for thine is the kingdom and glory forever and ever. Amen, right? That's not in Matthew 6. Um, but this is the Lord's Prayer, right? This is how Jesus says that we should pray. And it's easy to, to, to think, okay, Jesus said we should pray like that, so let's just say that prayer. And while I don't think there's anything wrong with saying the Lord's Prayer, I think if we just memorize it and use it as a liturgical saying that we miss the power that Jesus is talking about in the middle of this. You see, prayer is more than asking God to answer your prayer requests. And too often I think we approach him like that as, all right, we have this list of requests. We're going to check off this box. We may read the Lord's Prayer. But prayer is more than asking God to answer your prayer requests. Prayer is asking God to move on your behalf and on the behalf of others. This is what I mean. Look at this prayer. Let's break it down for just a second and look what Jesus says. Right? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. That's worship. That's recognizing that you have the opportunity to have a conversation with the creator of everything and worship him. Hallowed be your name. That's holy are you God. That's a, that's a, that's a prayer of worship. Right, verse 10, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's just saying, God, we need your will, your purpose here and now. We need you to move on our behalf and let your will, what you want to happen, we want to be in alignment to that. Then verse 11, give us this day our daily bread. Remember verse 11, right? Because that's a prayer request. Give us what we need today. We have a need. Today it's bread. Give us today the needs that we have for today. We're hungry today. We need some food. Give us bread today. Verse 12, and forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. You know in all the Lord's Prayer how many prayer requests there are? One small verse. One little part is a prayer request. Now, I don't think asking God and petitioning God for these things is wrong, but I think if we only approach God to bless our meals and to answer our requests, we're missing out on that relationship. You see, prayer asks God to move on our behalf. I mean, look at this. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We're actually praying and asking for the will of the God of heaven to come down to the earth for us. Forgive us. Forgive us. The only reason we can even approach God is because forgiveness. But too often we we skip out on the Father forgive me parts of our prayers until we're really desperate. Or until we've really messed up. Or the truth is until we've got busted messing up. Oh, but then here's this other one. And none of us really like this one. Forgive us our debts also as we forgive our debtors. That doesn't mean giving people a break and not paying back the money they owed you. 
That means forgiving people for how they have wronged you. Let me tell you why we don't like that verse. It's because we don't like to forgive people. We like to be mad at people. Luke talked about this last week. This is hard. Retaliation seems normal. That seems natural. Forgiveness does not. We like unforgiveness. We like being mad at people. But when Jesus says you're having a relational conversation with the Father of all creation, you should ask him to forgive you and give you the ability to forgive somebody else. And then verse 13, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Father, position us in a place where we're not going to sin anymore. Deliver us from the places that, that, that are tempting. Keep evil away from us. Out of all of those things, there's one section that's a prayer request. The rest is petitioning God to move in you or on your behalf or on someone else's behalf. You know, this isn't a sermon about intercessory prayer. That's another sermon for another day, and it's a powerful, powerful subject. But I would be remiss if I didn't mention the fact that when we are asking God to move on someone else's behalf, that is a powerful way to us to align our hearts to God. But forgiveness is hard to pray for. Or it's easy if we're asking God to bless somebody else, if we like that person and they're nice to us and we have a good relationship with us, them. But if we're fighting with them or we're angry with them or we need to forgive them, that's not an easy prayer to pray. We want to pray other things. We want to pray bad things on them. God, make all four of their tires flat when they come out from work today. Like, that's like, let their favorite sports teams lose to my favorite sports team. Like, that's the prayers we want to pray. Those are kind of nice versions of them. <laughs> Jesus says we should pray for forgiving them. You know, it's interesting. Uh, when I do marriage counseling sometime and I talk to a couple that's fighting a lot, sometimes one of the things I will, I will suggest is that in the middle of like a really heated fight that they stop and that they pray for each other. You know why? It's really hard to fight for someone you just asked God to bless. Like, it's not easy. We don't like that. One of the best ways that we can align our hearts to forgiveness is asking God to help us forgive others. Sp scripture speaks again and again and again about the power of praying for others. Read Psalms. It's like every other verse. But when we approach God, with a list of needs, we can miss sometimes the works that he wants to do. And sometimes that work is in you, and sometimes that work is through you. But don't miss this. When we ask God to help us forgive others, when we ask God to do something on behalf of someone else, we're not saying, hey, God, I'm really going to try at this. But sometimes that's what we do, right? We say, God, I, I'm going to forgive this person. And we think, all right, now it's all up to me. But that's not what that says. We're asking the God of everything to, to supernaturally do something in our hearts that aligns us with his will in heaven here on earth so that we can live and love other people in a better way. And if we ask God to move in our hearts, we, we should expect him to do it. We shouldn't expect it all to be on our shoulders. Don't forget, it's not a one-way conversation. We're not just throwing words at the sky. We're interacting with the God of all creation. And it's a relationship. That's two ways. And sometimes after we pray, we need to listen to. We need to quiet our hearts. Instead of going, okay, amen, see you later. See you at group next week, bye. We need to sit and listen to what the Father is speaking to us. You see, prayer should impact how we interact with those around us. You know, when talking about the concept of forgiveness, you know, verse 14 and 15 talk about this specifically, right? After Jesus says, you should pray like this, this is what he says. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. That's a sharp phrase. Like, we don't like, that's one of the verses we don't like in the Bible. Forgiveness is important. Relationships are important. Jesus talks about it. Jesus preached it. Jesus even included it in how we pray. You see, prayer has the ability to change how we interact with others in ways that would be impossible without God. 
That is why we have to recognize that when we ask God to help us, when we ask God to move on our behalf, he can do something in us supernatural that we can't do on our own. That's not ethereal, right? That's not a conceptual thing. That's an actual real life thing. Are you having problems forgiving someone? Start praying for them. Asking God to ask God to give you the ability to forgive them. And don't relent on that. You will be amazed how your heart can change. And it's not just because you're saying the words over and over. It's because the God of all creation is moving in your heart. You see, when we prioritize prayer, we prioritize our relationship with God. And when it's more than just a passing thing at meals or small groups or at bedtime, when we take the time to interact with God on, in prayer on a regular basis, when we prioritize that, we are prioritizing our relationship with Him. If I said I was going to prioritize my relationship with my family, but I never spent any time with my family, would anyone believe me? No. If we want to prioritize our relationship with God, we've got to to spend time prioritizing prayer because that's our relational conversation with him. When I was in college, I was part of a group of, uh, of people that went around to different places uh, witnessing, sharing our faith. And we went to uh, Austin, downtown Austin. There's a, a street called Sixth Street, which is kind of like the party central in Austin. And we went during Mardi Gras. And Austin, during Mardi Gras on Sixth Street is really, really wants to rival Bourbon Street. Like, there's a lot of debauchery going on. Um, and what we did is we, we took a casket. We marched down the 6th Street, people all around us carrying this casket. And we set it up in this area. And, I mean, it was like our gimmick, right? Like, freak people out a little bit. And then people would come up to us and say, hey, like, what's the deal with the casket? And our bit, like our little pitch was, well, 10 out of 10 people are going to die one day. Do you know what's going to happen to you after you die? Right? That was the pitch. <laughs> like, here, let's start with the gimmick, and let me then tell you about Jesus. And that's what we used. And so our, our, we're, we're talking to different people, sometimes successfully, sometimes we're just trying to talk to people we can't understand because they're so inebriated, like they're not even speaking English anymore. And still trying to share some love, the love of Jesus with some people. And I'm having this conversation with someone. It's actually going really well. Um, and I see out of the corner of my eye, there's a guy, he's, he's about this tall, he's a little bit shorter than me, and he's got a, a, a cr close crop haircut, and he's pretty, like, stocky like muscular so in my mind I'm going like I think he's in the military and so I'm having this conversation with this guy and it's really well and I end up praying with him getting connected to some of the church leaders that we're working with and I turn over to this person his name is Brian and Brian says hey man what's what's all this about and I said you know I gave him my pitch and 10 out of 10 people are going to die one day do you know what's going to happen to you after you die and he goes, no. Hey, tell me what I need to do to be saved. <laughs> I'll tell you, like, in all of my life as a Christian, like, witnessing to people, no one has actually said that phrase. I've read that in Scripture. No one has said that to me before or since. Just tell me how I can be saved. So, you know, I, I kind of go off script and, and, and connect in more of a relational way with him and I'm sharing with him my faith and about Jesus. And, and here we are, and I pray for him. And he's crying and he's weeping and I'm crying and we're surrounded by all these drunk partiers on 6th Street. And he's like, man, I go back. Like, I'm only here. I was only here for five days. I'm going back tomorrow morning. I'm going back to Iraq. And then he looks at me and goes, how do I pray? Can you tell me how to pray? <laughs> and again, I'm going, oh my gosh, like, this is what we see in Scripture. So I open the Lord's Prayer, and I'm like, hey, and I'm trying to explain to him some of these same things, that this is a relationship. It's not about saying the right things or the wrong things. It's, it's in, in, in the desperate moments when you cry out to God, but also in the peaceful moments when you cry out to God. And it's how we can build a relationship. And again, I'm praying with him, and he's just weeping, and the both of us are crying because I don't know if I'm ever going to see this guy again. I don't know what's going to happen to him the next week. But I know this. He chose to follow Jesus, and it allowed him the opportunity to have interaction and a relationship with the Father, and he wanted that, and he wanted prayer so he could have that. And that is the desperation I want for prayer, and that I'm not always good at. Because it's Sunday. After church, I can go home, eat some lunch, take a nap. 
I don't need that prayer. And when I do need it, I can always call it back up. But in season and out of season, in the moment of crisis, in the everyday, we pray without ceasing because it's a relationship. It's the opportunity to walk hand in hand with the Creator. And He desires to have a relationship with us. We read the Lord's Prayer a lot. And I think that it's good to read. I think it's, it's great to say it. I don't think that speaking scripture is ever bad. I don't think praying scripture is ever bad. But what I want to uh, caution us to is we have to avoid falling into the trap that prayer is just a formula of saying the right words. Because what Jesus gave us wasn't just a formula for prayer. It was a relational model on how to live. And it's through his sacrifice for us that we have the opportunity to do that. And I promise you this, if we can live as men and women who follow God and are, pr- are men and women of prayer and are interacting with the God of the universe and, and, and continue to grow in our relationship with him, we'll live a good life, a significantly better life than we would ever accomplish on our own. That's good news.